An LAP shuttle is shaped like a teardrop, bottom heavy with thrusters, with a nose that could cut through steel. Of course, our heroes weren't in an LAP shuttle, they were in the Ambassador's luxury cruiser. Comfort was definitely favored over speed. It had a nose like a gnome's behind, bulky and expensive looking, with a grill you could use to barbecue buffalo. So you're saying this fissure is going to open up for a couple minutes and I'll have to fly through, and that's the entire plan? said Holly. It's the best we got, said Root glumly. Well, at least we'll be in padded seats when we get squashed. This thing handles like a three-legged rhinoceros. How was I supposed to know, grumbled Root. This was supposed to be a routine run. This shuttle has excellent stereo. Butler raised his hand. Listen, what's that sound? They listened. The noise came from below, like a giant clearing its throat. Holly consulted the keel cams. Flare, she announced. Big sucker. It'll be roasting our tail feathers any minute. The rock face before them cracked and groaned in constant expansion and contraction. Fishers heaved like grinding mouths lined with black teeth. That's it. Let's go, urged Mulch. That fisher is going to seal up faster than the stinkworms. Not enough room yet, snapped Holly. This is a shuttle, not one fat dwarf riding stolen wings. Mulch was too scared to be insulted. Just move it. It'll widen as we go. Generally, Holly would have waited for Root to give the green light, but this was her area. No one was going to argue with Captain Holly short at the controls of a shuttle. The chasm shuddered open another few feet. Holly gritted her teeth. Hold on to your ears, she said, ramming the thrusters to maximum. The craft's occupants clutched their armrests, and more than one closed his eyes. But not Artemis. He couldn't. There was something morbidly fascinating about flying into an uncharted tunnel at reckless speeds, with only a kleptomaniac dwarf's word of what lay on the other end. Holly concentrated on her instruments. Whole cameras and sensors fed information to various screens and speakers. Sonar was going crazy, beeping so fast it was an almost constant whine. Fixed halogen headlights fed frightening images to the monitors, and laser radar drew a green 3D line picture on a dark screen. Then, of course, there was the quartz windshield, but with sheets of rock, dust, and larger debris, the naked eye was next to useless. Temperature increasing, she muttered, glancing at the rearview monitor. An orange magma column blasted past the fissure mouth, spilling over into the tunnel. They were in a desperate race. The fissure was closing behind them and expanding before the craft's brow. The noise was terrific, thunder in a bubble. Mulch covered his ears. Next time I'll take Howler's Peak. Quiet, convict, growled Root. This was all your idea. The arguing was interrupted by a tremendous grating sound and a shower of sparks that danced across the windshield. Sorry, apologized Captain Short. There goes our communications array. She flipped the craft sideways, scraping between two shifting plates. The plates crashed behind them, a giant's hand clap. The magma's heat coated the rock face, dragging the plates together. A jagged edge clipped the shuttle's rear. Butler held his weapon. It was a comfort thing. Then they were through, spiraling into a cavern toward three enormous titanium rods. There, gasped Mulch, the foundation rods. Holly rolled her eyes. You don't say, she groaned, firing the docking clamps. Mulch had drawn another diagram. This one looked like a bendy snake. We're being led by an idiot with a crayon, said Root with deceptive calmness. I got you this far, didn't I, Julius? pouted Mulch. Holly was finishing the last bottle of mineral water. A good third of it went over her head. Don't you dare start sulking, dwarf, she said. As far as I can see, we're stuck in the center of the earth with no way out and no communications. Mulch backed up a step. I can see you're a bit tense after the flight. Let's all calm down now, shall we? Nobody looked very calm. Even Artemis seemed slightly shaken by their ordeal. That's the hard bit over. We're in the foundations now. The only way is up. Oh, really, convict, said Root. And how do you suggest we go up exactly? Mulch plucked a carrot from the larder, waving it at his diagram. This here is a snake. No, Julius, it's one of the foundation rods. The solid titanium foundation rods sunk in impregnable rock? The very ones. Except this one isn't solid, exactly. Artemis nodded. I thought so. You cut corners on this work, didn't you, Mulch? Mulch was unrepentant. You know what building regulations are like. 
Sarla titanium pillars? Do you have any idea how expensive that is? Throw our estimate right off. So me and cousin Nord decided to forget the titanium packing. But you had to fill that column with something, interrupted the commander. Koboy would have run scans. Mulch nodded guiltily. We hooked up the sewage pipes to it for a couple of days. The sonographs came up clean. Holly felt her throat clench. Sewage? You mean... No, not anymore. That was a hundred years ago. It's just clay now. Very good clay, as it happens. Root's face could have boiled a large cauldron of water. You expect us to climb through twenty yards of manure? The dwarf shrugged. Hey, what do I care? Stay here forever if you want. I'm going up the pipe. Artemis did not like this sudden turn of events. Running, jumping, injury, okay. But sewage? This is your plan? He managed to stutter. What's the matter, mud boy? Smirked Mulch, afraid of getting your hands dirty. It was only a figure of speech, Artemis knew, but true nonetheless. He glanced at his slender fingers. Yesterday morning they had, pe they had been pianist's fingers, with manicured nails. Today they could have belonged to a builder. Holly clapped Artemis on the shoulder. Okay, she declared, let's do it. As soon as we save the lower elements, we can get back to rescuing your father. Holly noticed a change in Artemis's face, almost as if his features weren't sure how to arrange themselves. She paused, think realizing what she had said. For her, the remark had been a casual encouragement, the kind of thing an officer said every day. But it seemed as though Artemis was not accustomed to being a member of a team. Don't think I'm getting chummy or anything. It's just that when I give my word, I stick to it. Artemis decided not to respond. He had already been punched once today. They descended from the shuttle on a folding stairway. Artemis stepped onto the surface, picking his way through the jagged stones and construction debris abandoned by Mulch and his cousin a century earlier. The cavern was lit by the starlight twinkle of rock phosphorescence. This place is a geological marvel, he exclaimed. The pressure at this depth should be crushing us, but it isn't. He knelt to examine a fungus sprouting from a rusted paint tin. There's even life. Mulch wrenched the remains of a hammer from between two rocks. So that's where we've got to go. We overdid it a bit on the explosives, blasting the shaft for these columns. Some of our mice must have fallen down here. Holly was appalled. Pollution was an abomination to the people. You've broken so many laws here, Mulch. I don't even have the fingers to count them. When you get that two-day head start, you better move fast, because I'm going to be the one chasing you. Here we are, said Mulch, ignoring the threat. When you've heard as many as he had, they just rolled right off. There was a hole bored into one of the columns. Mulch rubbed the edges fondly. Diamond laser cutter. Little nuclear battery. That baby could cut through anything. I remember that cutter, too, said Root. You nearly decapitated it with me once. Mulch sighed. Ah, happy days, eh, Julius? Root's reply was a swift kick in the behind. Let's, let's talk more eating dirt, convict. Holly placed her hand into the hole. Air currents. The pressure field from the city must have equalized this cave over the years. That's why we're not as flat as manta rays right now. I see, said Butler and Root simultaneously. Another lie for the list. Mulch undid his back flap. I'll turn it to the top and wait for you there. Clear as much of the debris as you can. I'll spread the recycled mud around to avoid closing up the shaft. Artemis groaned. The idea of crawling through Mulch's recyclings was almost intolerable. Only the thought of his father kept him going. Mulch stepped into the shaft. Stand back, he warned, unhinging his jaw. Butler moved quickly. He was not about to get nailed by dwarf gas again. Mulch disappeared up to his waist in the titanium column. In moments, he had disappeared entirely. The, pe the pipe began to shudder with strange, unappetizing sounds. Chunks of clay clattered against the metal walls. A constant stream of condensed air and debris spiraled from the hole. Amazing, breathed Artemis. What I could do with ten like him. Fort Knox would be a pushover. Don't even think about it, warned Root. He turned to Butler. What have we got? The manservant drew his pistol. This is it. I'll take the gun, since I'm the only one who can lift it. You two pick up whatever you can on the run. And what about me? Asked Artemis, even though he knew what was coming. Butler asked his master straight in the eye. I want you to stay here. This is a military operation. All you can do is get yourself killed. But 
My job is to protect you, Artemis, and this is quite possibly the safest spot on the planet. Artemis didn't argue. In truth, these facts had already occurred to him. Sometimes being a genius was a burden. Very well, Butler. I shall remain here. Unless... Butler's eyes narrowed. Unless what? Artemis smiled his dangerous smile. Unless I have an idea. In Police Plaza, the situation was desperate. Captain Kelp had pulled the remaining forces into a circle behind overturned workstations. The goblins were taking pot shots through the doorway, and none of the warlocks had a drop of magic left in them. Anyone who got injured from now on would stay injured. The council were huddled behind a wall of troops, all except Wing Commander Vinyaya, who had demanded to be given one of the electronic rifles. She hadn't missed yet. The techs were crouched behind their desks, trying every code combination in the book to gain access to the operations booth. Trumbull didn't hold out much hope on that front. If Foley locked a door, then it stayed locked. Meanwhile, inside the booth, all the centaur could do was pound his fists in frustration. It was a sign of Cudgeon's cruelty that he allowed Foley to view the battle beyond the blast windows. It seemed hopeless. Even if Julius and Holly received his message, it was too late to do anything. Foley's lips and throat were dry. Everything had deserted him. His computer, his intellect, his glib sarcasm, everything. Something wet slapped Butler in the head. What was that? He hissed at Holly, who was bringing up the rear. Don't ask, croaked Captain Short. Even through her helmet filters, the smell was foul. The contents of the column had a century to ferment and smelled as toxic as the day they went in, probably worse. At least, thought the bodyguard, I don't have to eat this stuff. Root was in the lead, his helmet lights cutting swaths through the darkness. The pillar was on a 45 degree angle with irregular grooves that were intended to anchor the titanium block filling. Mulch had done a sterling job of breaking down the pipe's contents, but the recycling had to go somewhere. Mulch, in fairness to him, chewed every mouthful thoroughly to avoid too many lumps. The raiding party struggled on grimly, trying not to think about what they were actually doing. By the time they caught up with the dwarf, he was clinging to a ridge, face constricted in pain. What is it, Mulch? asked Root, concern accidentally slipping into his tones. Get up, Mulch groaned. Get up right now. Root's eyes widened with something approaching panic. Up, he hissed. Everybody up. They scrambled into the tight wedge of space above the dwarf. Not a second too soon. Mulch relaxed, releasing a burst of dwarf gas that could have inflated a circus tent. He rehinged his jaw. That's better, he sighed. A lot of air in the soil. Now, would you mind getting that beam out of my face? You know how I feel about light. The commander obliged, switching to infrared. Okay, now we're up here. How do we get out? You didn't bring your cutter, I seem to remember. The dwarf grinned. No problem. A good thief always plans on a return visit. See here. Mulch was pointing to a patch of titanium that seemed exactly like the rest of the pipe. I patched patched this up last time. It's just flexibond. Root had to smile. You are a cunning reprobate. How did we ever catch you? Luck, replied the dwarf, elbowing a section of the pipe. A large circle popped out, revealing the hundred-year-old hole. Welcome to Cowboy Labs. They clambered into a dimly lit corridor. Loaded hover trolleys were stacked four deep around the walls. Strip lighting operated at minimum illumination overhead. I know this place, noted Root. I've been here before on inspection for the special weapons permits. We're two corridors across from the computer center. We have a real chance of making it. What about those DNA stun cannons? inquired Butler. Tricky, admitted the commander. If the cannon's onboard computer doesn't recognize you, you're dead. They can be programmed to reject entire species. Tricky, agreed the manservant. I'm betting they're not active, continued Root. First, if this place is crawling with goblins, they hardly come in through the front door. And second, if Foley is being blamed for this little uprising, Cowboy will want to pretend they had no weapons, just like the LEP. Strategy? asked Butler. Not much, admitted the commander. Once we turn the corner, we're on camera. So down the corridor as fast as you can, hit anything that gets in your way. If it has a weapon, confiscate it. Mulch, you stay here and widen the tunnel. We may need to get out fast. Ready? Holly extended a hand. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. 
the commander and manservant laid their hands on hers. Likewise. They headed down the corridor. 200 goblins versus our virtually unarmed three heroes. It was going to be close. Intruders, squealed Opal Cowboy delightedly, inside the building. Kudgeon crossed to the surveillance plasma screen. I do believe it's Julius. Amazing. Obviously your hit team leader was exaggerating, General Spuda. Spuda licked his eyeballs furiously. Lieutenant Nyal would be losing his skin before shedding season. Kudgeon whispered into Opal's ear. Can we activate the DNA cannons? The pixie shook her head. Not immediately. They've been reprogrammed to reject goblin DNA. It would take a few minutes. Kudgeon turned to the four general go goblins. Have you a armored squad come up behind, and another one from the flank. We can trap them at the door. There will be no way out. Kudgeon stared raptly at the plasma screen. This is even better than I'd planned. Now, my old friend Julius, it's my turn to humiliate you. Artemis was meditating. This was a time for concentration. He sat cross-legged on a rock, visualizing the various rescue strategies that could be used when they returned to the Arctic. If the Mafia managed to set up the drop before Artemis could reach them, then there was only one plan that could work, and it was a high-risk plan. Artemis searched deeper inside his brain. There must be another way. He was disturbed by an orchestral noise emanating from the titanium column. It sounded like a sustained note on a bassoon. Dwarf gas, he reasoned. The column had reasonably good acoustics. What he needed was a brainwave. One crystal thought that would slice through this mire he had become embroiled in and save the day. After eight minutes, he was interrupted again. Not gas this time. A cry for help. Mulch was in trouble and in pain. Artemis was about to suggest that Butler deal with it when he realized that his bodyguard wasn't there, off on his mission to save the lower elements. It was up to him. Artemis poked his head into the column. It was black as the inside of an old boot, and twice as pungent. Artemis decided that an LEP helmet would be his first requirement. He quickly retrieved a spare from the shuttle, and after a moment's experimentation, activated the lights and seals. Mulch, are you up there? No reply. Could this be a trap? Was it possible that he, Artemis Fowl, was about to fall for the oldest ruse in the book? Entirely possible, he decided, but in spite of that, he couldn't really afford to take chances with that hairy little creature's life. Somewhere since Los Angeles, and against his better judgment, he had bonded with Mr. Diggums. Artemis shuddered. This propensity for humane impulses was happening more and more since his mother's return to sanity. Artemis climbed into the tube, beginning his journey to the disk of light above. The smell was horrendous. His shoes were ruined, and no amount of dry cleaning could redeem the St. Bartleby's blazer. Mulch had better be in a lot of pain. When he reached the entrance, he found Mulch writhing on the floor, face contorted in genuine agony. What is it? he asked, peeling off the helmet and kneeling by the dwarf's guy side. Blockage in my gut, grunted the dwarf, beads of sweat sliding down his beard hairs. Something hard. Can't break it down. What can I do? Artemis asked, though he dreaded the possible replies. My left boot. Take it off. Your boot? Did you say boot? Yes, howled the dwarf, pain stiffening his entire torso. Get it off! Artemis couldn't stifle a relieved sigh. He had been fearing much worse. He hefted the dwarf's leg into his lap, pulling off at the climbing boots. Nice boots, he commented. Rodeo drive, gasped Mulch. Now if you wouldn't mind. Sorry. The boot slid off, revealing a not-quite-so-designer sock, complete with toe holes and darned patches. Little toe, said Mulch, eyes closed with pain. Little toe what? Squeeze the joint. Hard. Squeeze the joint. Must be a reflexology thing. Every part of the body corresponds to an area of the foot. The body's keyboard, so to speak. Practiced in the Orient for centuries. Very well, if you insist. Artemis placed his finger and thumb around Mulch's hairy toe. It could have been his imagination, but it seemed that the hairs parted to allow him access. Squeeze, gasped the dwarf. Why aren't you squeezing? Artemis wasn't squeezing because his eyes were crossed looking at the end of a laser barrel stuck in the middle of his forehead. Lieutenant Nile, who was holding the weapon, couldn't believe his luck. He'd single-handedly captured two intruders, 
Plus, he discovered their bolt hole. Who said hanging back to avoid the fighting didn't have advantages? This was turning out to be an exceptional revolution for him. He'd be a colonel before shedding his third skin. On your feet, he ordered, panting blue flames. Even to the translator, it sounded reptilian. Artemis stood slowly, lifting Mulch's leg with him. The dwarf's back flap flopped open. What's wrong with him anyway? asked Nile, bending in for a closer look. Something he ate, said Artemis, and squeezed the joint. The resulting explosion knocked the goblin off his feet, sending him tumbling down the corridor. That was something you didn't see every day. Mulch hopped to his feet. Ah, thanks, kid. I thought I was a goner there. Must have been something hard. Granite, maybe? Or diamond? Artemis nodded, not ready for words. Those goblins are dumb. Did you see the look on his face? Artemis shook his head. Still not ready. Do you want to go look? The tactless humor snapped Artemis out of his daze. That goblin, I doubt he was on his own. Mulch buttoned up his back flap. Nope, a whole squadron of them just went past. This guy must have been trying to avoid the action. <laughs> Typical goblin. Artemis rubbed his temples. There must be something he could do to help his friend. He had the highest tested IQ in Europe, for heaven's sake. Mulch, I have an important question for you. I suppose I owe you one for saving my hide. Artemis draped an arm around the dwarf's shoulder. I know how you got into Cowboy Labs, but you couldn't go back that way. The flare would have gotten you. So how did you get out? Mulch grinned. Simple. I activated the alarm and then left in the LEP uniform I came in. Artemis scowled. No, there must be another way. There has to be. The DNA cannons were obviously out of commission. Root was just starting to feel optimistic when he heard the thunder of approaching boots. Darvit, you two keep going. I'll hold them here as long as I can. No, Commander, said Butler. With respect, we only have one weapon, and I can hit a lot more with it than you. I'll take them coming around the corner. You try to get the door open. Holly opened her mouth to argue. But who was going to argue with a man that size? Okay, good luck. If you're wounded, lie as still as you can until I get back. Four minutes, remember. A butler nodded. I remember. And butler? Yes, yes, Captain. That little misunderstanding last year, when you and Artemis kidnapped me? Butler gazed at the ceiling. He would have stared at his shoes, but Holly was in the way. Yes, that. I've been meaning to talk to... Just forget it. After this, I'll square. Holly, move it out, ordered Root. Butler, don't let them get too close. Butler wrapped his fingers around the gun's molded grip. He looked like an armed bear. They better not, for their sake. Artemis climbed up on a hover trolley, tapping one of the overhead conduits that ran the length of the corridor. This pipe appears to run along the entire ceiling structure. What is it, a ventilation system? Mulch snorted. I wish. It's the plasma supply for the DNA cannons. So why did you come in this way? Oh, a little matter of there being enough charge in every drop of plasma to fry a troll. Artemis placed his palm against the metal. What if the cannons weren't operational? Once the cannons are deactivated, the plasma is just so much radioactive slop. Radioactive? Mulch tugged at his beard thoughtfully. Actually, Julius reckons the cannons have been turned off. Any way to be certain? We could open this unopenable panel. Mulch ran his fingers along the curved surface. Ah, see here? A micro keyhole. To service the cannons. Even plasma needs recharging. He pointed to a tiny hole in the metal, which could have been a speck of dirt it was so small. Now, observe a master at work. The dwarf led, fed one of his chin hairs into the hole. When the tip reappeared, Mulch plucked the hair out by the root. The hair died as soon as Mulch plucked it, stiffening into rigor mortis and retaining the precise shape of the lock's interior. Mulch held his breath, twisting the makeshift key. The hatch dr dropped open. That, my boy, is talent. Inside the pipe, an orange jelly pulsed gently. Occasional sparks roiled in its depths. The plasma was too dense even to spill from the hatch and retained its cylindrical shape. Mulch squinted through the wobbling gel. Deactivated, all right. If that stuff was live, our faces would be getting a nice tan about now. What about those sparks? Residual charge. They'd give you a bit of a tingle, but nothing serious. Artemis nodded. 
Right, he said, strapping on the helmet. Mulch blanched. You're not serious, Mudwell. Do you have any idea what would happen if those cannons were activated? I'm trying not to think about it. It's probably just as well. The dwarf shook his head bewildered. Okay, you've got 30 yards to go and no more than 10 minutes of air in that helmet. Keep the filters closed. The air may get a bit stale after a while, but it's better than sucking plasma. And here, take this. He plucked the stiffened hair from the keyhole. What for? I presume you'll want to get out again at the other end. Or hadn't you thought of that, genius boy? Artemis swallowed. He hadn't. There was more to this heroism thing than just rushing in blindly. Just feed it in gently. Remember, it's hair, not metal. Feed it in gently. Got it. And don't use the lights. Halogen could reactivate the plasma. Artemis felt his head beginning to spin. And make sure you get foamed as soon as you can. The anti-rad canisters are blue. There's everywhere in this facility. Blue canisters. Anything else, Mr. Diggums? Well, there are the plasma snakes. Artemis's knees almost collapsed. You're not serious. No, Mulch conceded. I'm not. Now, your reach is about one and a half feet. So calculate for 60 pulls and then get out of there. Slightly under one and a half feet, I'd say. Perhaps 63 pulls. He placed the dwarf hair inside his breast pocket. Mulch shrugged. Whatever, kid, it's your skin. Now in you go. The dwarf interlaced his fingers, and Artemis stepped into the makeshift stirrup. He was considering changing his mind when Mr. Diggums heaved him into the plasma. The orange gel sucked him in, enveloping his body in a second. The plasma coiled around him like a living being, popping bubbles of air trapped in his clothing. A residual spark brushed his leg, sending sharp pain through his body. A bit of a tingle. Artemis gazed out through the orange gel. Mulch was there giving him the thumbs up grinning like a loon. Artemis decided that if he made it through this lunacy, then he would have to place the dwarf on the payroll. Artemis began to crawl blindly. One pull, two pulls. 63 seemed a long way off. Butler cocked his weapon. The footsteps were ear-splitting now, bouncing off the metal walls. Shadows stretched around the corner, ahead of their owners. The manservant took approximate aim. A head appeared, frog-like, licking its own eyeballs. Butler pulled the trigger. The slug punched a melon-sized hole in the wall above the goblin's head. The head was hurriedly withdrawn. Of course, Butler had missed on purpose. Scared was always better than dead, but it couldn't last forever. Twelve more shots to be precise. The goblins grew braver, sneaking out farther and farther. Eventually, Butler knew he'd be forced to shoot one. Butler decided that it was time to get to close quarters. He rose from his haunches, making slightly less noise than a panther, and hurtled down the corridor towards the enemy. There were only two men on the planet better educated in the various martial arts than Butler, and he was related to one of them. The other lived on an island in the South China Sea, and spent his days meditating and beating up palm trees. You really had to feel sorry for the Bawakel. The Bawakel had two guards on the sanctum door both armed to the teeth and both thick as several short planks. In spite of repeated warnings, they were both fallen asleep inside their helmets when the elves came running around the corridor. Look, mumbled one, elves. Huh? said the other, the denser of the two. Don't matter, said number one. L.E.P. don't got no guns. Number two gave his eyeballs a lick. Yeah, but they sure are irritable. And that was when Holly's boot connected with his chest, slamming him into the wall. Hey, complained number one, bringing up his own gun. No fair. Root didn't bother with fancy spinny kicks, preferring instead to body slam the sentry against the titanium door. There, panted Holly. Two down. That wasn't so hard. A premature statement, as it happened, because that was when the rest of the 200-strong Bawakel squadron thundered down the perpendicular corridor. That wasn't so hard, mimicked the commander, curling his fingers into fists. Artemis' concentration was failing him. There seemed to be more sparks now, and each shock disrupted his focus. He had lost count twice. He was at 54 now, or 56. The difference was life or death. He trolled ahead, reaching out one arm and then the other, swimming through a turgid sea of gel. Vision was next to useless. Everything was orange. 
and the only confirmation he had that any progress was being made was that when his knee sank into a recess, where the plasma diverted into a cannon. 63. That was it. Artemis propelled himself one last time through the gel, filling his lungs with stale air. Soon, the air purifiers in his helmet would be useless, and he would be breathing carbon dioxide. Artemis placed his fingertips against the pipe's inner curve, searching for a keyhole. Again, his eyes were no help. He couldn't even activate the helmet lights for fear of igniting a river of plasma. Nothing. No indent. He was going to die here alone. He would never be great. Artemis felt his brain going, spiraling off into a black tunnel. Concentrate, he told himself. Focus. There was a spark approaching. A silver star in the sunset. It coiled lazily along the tube, illuminating each section it passed. There! A hole. The hole revealed for a moment by the passing spark. Artemis reached into his pocket like a drunken swimmer, pulling out the dwarf hair. Would it work? There was no reason his access port should have a different locking mechanism. Artemis slid the hair into the keyhole. Gently. He squinted through the gel. Was it going in? He thought so. Perhaps 60% sure. It would have to be enough. Artemis twisted. The flap dropped open. He imagined Mulch's grin. That, my boy, is talent. It was quite possible that every enemy he had in the underworld was waiting outside that hatch, big, nasty guns pointed at his head. At that point, Artemis didn't much care. He couldn't bear one more of his own oxygen-depleted breaths or one more excruciating shock to his body. So, Artemis Fowl poked his helmet through the plasma surface. He flipped the visor, savoring what he could very well be his last breath. Lucky for him, the room's occupants were looking at the view screen, watching his friends fight for their lives. There are too many, thought Butler, rounding the corner to see a virtual army of Bawakel slotting fresh batteries into their weapons. The goblins, when they noticed him, began to think things like, Oh gods, it's a troll in clothes. Or, Why didn't I listen to mom and stay out of the gangs? Then Butler was above them, on the way down. He landed like the proverbial ton of bricks, but with considerably more precision. Three goblins were out cold before they even knew they'd been hit. He shot one shot himself in the foot, and several others laid down, pretending to be unconscious. Artemis watched it all on the control room's plasma screen, along with all the other occupants of the inner sanctum. It was entertainment to them. The goblin generals chuckled and winced as Butler decimated their men. It was all immaterial. There were hundreds of goblins in the building, and no way into this room. Artemis had seconds to decide on a course of action. Seconds. And he had no idea how to use any of this technology. He scanned the walls below him for something he could use. Anything. There, on a small picture screen away from the main console, was Foley, trapped in the operations booth. The centaur would have a plan. He certainly had time to come up with one. Artemis knew that as soon as he emerged from the conduit, he was a target. They would kill him without hesitation. Artemis dragged himself from within the tube, falling to earth with a thick slap. His saturated clothes slowed his progress to the monitor bank. Heads were turning. He could see them from the corner of his eye. Figures came his way. He didn't know how many. There was a read mic below Foley's image. Artemis pressed the button. Foley, he rasped, globs of gel splatting onto the console. Can you hear me? The centaur reacted instantly. Foul? What happened to you? Five seconds, Foley. I need a plan or we're all dead. Foley nodded curtly. I've got one. Put me on all the screens. What? How? Press the conference button. Yellow. A circle with lines shooting out, like the sun. Do you see it? Artemis saw it. He pressed it. Then something pressed him. Very painfully. General Skei Ling noticed the creature flopping from the plasma pipe. What was it? A pixie? No. No, by all the gods, it was human. Look, he cackled, a mud man. The others were oblivious, too interested in the spectacle on screen. But not Kudjin, a human in the inner sanctum. How could this be? He seized Skei Ling by the shoulders. Kill him quickly. All the generals were listening now. There was killing to be done. The human stumbled to one of the consoles, and they surrounded him, tongues dangling excitedly. Spuda spun the human around to face his fate. One by one, 
the generals conjured fireballs around their fists, closing in for the kill. But then something made them completely forget the injured human. Kudjan's face had appeared on all the screens, and the Bawakel executives didn't like what he was saying. Just when things are at their most desperate, I shall instruct Opal to return weapons control to the LEP. The Bawakel will be rendered unconscious, and you will be blamed for the entire affair, providing you survive, which I doubt. Spuda whirled on his ally. Kajin, what does this mean? The generals advanced, hissing and spitting. Treachery, Kajin, treachery. Kajin was not unduly worried. Okay, he said, treachery. It took Kudjan a moment to figure out what had happened. It was Foley. He must have recorded the conversation somehow. How tiresome. Still, you had to hand it to the centaur. He was resourceful. Kudjan quickly crossed to the main console, shutting off the broadcast. It wouldn't do for Opal to hear the rest of it, particularly the part concerning her tragic accident. He really would have to cut off on his grandstanding. Still, no matter. Everything was on track. Treachery! hissed Scaling. Okay, admitted Kudjan again. Treachery. And directly after he said, after that, he said, Computer, activate DNA cannons. Authorization Kudjan B Alpha Alpha 2 2. On her hover chair, Opal spun with sheer joy, clapping her tiny hands in delight. Briar was so ugly, but he was so evil. Throughout Cowboy Labs, robot DNA cannons perked up in their cradles and ran swift self diagnostics. Apart from a slight drain in the inner sanctum, everything was in order. And so, without further ado, they began to obey their program parameters and targeted anything with goblin DNA at a rate of 10 blasts per second. It was swift, and as with everything Cowboy, efficient. In less than 5 seconds, the cannons settled back into their cradles. Mission accomplished. 200 unconscious goblins throughout the facility. Phew, said Holly, stepping over rows of snoring goblins. Close one. Tell me about it, agreed Root. Kudjan kicked Spuda's sleeping body. You see, you haven't accomplished anything, Artemis Fowl, he said, drawing his red boy. Your friends are out there, you're in here, and the goblins are unconscious, soon to be artificially mind-wiped with some particularly unstable chemicals, just as I planned. He smiled at Opal hovering above them. Just as we planned. Opal returned the smile. At another time, Artemis would have been forced to pass a snide comment, but the possibility of imminent death was occupying his thoughts for the moment. Now I simply reprogram the cannons to target your friends, return power to the LEP cannons, and take over the world, and nobody can get here to stop me. Of course, you should never say something like that, especially when you're an arch-villain. It's just asking for trouble. Butler hurried down the corridor, catching up with the others outside the inner sanctum. He could see Artemis's predicament through the door's quartz pane. In spite of all his efforts, Master Artemis had still managed to place himself in mortal danger. How was a bodyguard supposed to do his job when his charge insisted on jumping into bear pits, so to speak? Butler felt the testosterone building in his system. One door was all that separated him from Artemis. One little door, designed to withstand fairies with ray guns. He took several steps backward. Holly could tell what he was thinking. Don't bother, that door is reinforced. The manservant didn't answer. He couldn't. The real butler was submerged beneath layers of adrenaline and brute force. With a roar, butler charged the entrance, concentrating all of his considerable might into the triangular point of his shoulder. It was a blow that would have felled a medium-sized hippopotamus. And when this door was tested for plasma dispersion and moderate physical resistance, it certainly was not butler-proof. The metal portal crumpled like tinfoil. Butler's momentum took him halfway across the inner sanctum's rubber tiling. Holly and Root followed, pausing only to grab some soft-nosed lasers. Cudgeon moved fast, dragging Artemis upright. Don't move any of you or I'll kill the mud boy. Butler kept right on going. His last rational thought had been to disable Kudjan. Now this was his sole aim in life. He raced forward, arms outstretched. Holly dived desperately, latching onto Butler's belt. He dragged her like cans behind a wedding car. Butler, stop! She grunted. The bodyguard ignored her. Holly hung on, digging in her heels. Stop! 
she repeated, this time layering her voice with the mesmer. Butler seemed to wake up. He shook the caveman from his system. That's right, mud man, said Cudgeon. Listen to Captain Short. Surely we can work something out here. No deals, Briar, said Root. It's all over. Just put the mud boy down. Cudgeon cocked the red boy. I'll put him down, all right. This was Butler's worst nightmare. His charge was in the hands of a psychopath with nothing to lose, and there was nothing he could do about it. Artemis's phone rang. I think it's mine, said Artemis automatically. Another ring. Definitely his cell phone. Amazing the thing worked at all, really, considering what it had been through. Artemis ripped open the case. Yes? It was one of those frozen moments. Nobody knew what to expect. Artemis tossed the handset to Opal Cowboy. It's for you. The pixie swooped low to catch the tiny cell phone. Cudgeon's chest heaved. His body knew what was happening, even if his brain hadn't figured it out yet. Opal placed the tiny speaker to her pointed ear. Really, Foley, said Cudgeon's voice. Do you think I'd go to all this trouble to share power? Oh no, as soon as this charade is over, Miss Cowboy will have a tragic accident. Perhaps several tragic accidents. All color drained from Opal's face. Phew, she screeched. It's a trick protested Cudgeon. They're trying to turn us against each other. But his eyes told the true story. Pixies are feisty creatures in spite of their size. They put up with only so much, and then they explode. For Opal Cowboy, it was explosion time. She manipulated the hoverboy's controls, dropping in a steep dive. Cudgeon didn't hesitate. He put two bursts into the chair, but the thick cushion protected its pilot. Opal Cowboy flew straight at Cudgeon's head. When the elf raised his arms to protect himself, Artemis slid to the floor. Briar Cudgeon was not so lucky. He was borne aloft by the wildcat pixie, desperately pumping the red boy's trigger. Opal was past caring about the laser beam that grazed her ribs. Her sole aim in life was to destroy her treacherous partner. They whirled around the chamber, ricocheting off several walls before crashing straight through the open plasma panel. Unfortunately for Cudgeon, the plasma was now active. He had activated it himself. But this irony did not occur to him as he was fried by a million radioactive tendrils. Cowboy was lucky. She was pitched from the hover chair and lay moaning on the rubber tiles. Butler was on the move before Cudgeon landed. He flipped Artemis over, checking his frame for wounds. A couple of scratches, superficial. Nothing a shot of blue sparks wouldn't take care of. Holly checked Opal Cowboy's status. She conscious? asked the commander. Cowboy's eyes flickered open. Holly shut them with a swift rabbit punch to the forehead. Nope, she said innocently. Out cold. Root took one look at Cudgeon and realized there was no point checking for vitals. Maybe he was better off. The alternative would have been a couple of centuries in Howler's Peak. Artemis noticed movement by the door. It was Mulch. He was grinning and waving. Waving goodbye, just in case Julius forgot about his two-day head start. The dwarf pointed to the blue canister mounted on the bracket wall, and he was gone. Butler, rasped Artemis with the absolute last ounce of his strength. Could someone spray me down, and then could we please go to Murmansk? Butler was mystified. Spray? What spray? Holly unhooked the anti-rad foam canister, flipping the safety catch. Allow me, she grinned. It would be my pleasure. She directed a jet of foul-smelling foam at Artemis. In seconds, he resembled a half-melted snowman. Holly laughed. Who said there were no perks in law enforcement? Once the cannon plasma had short-circuited Kudge's remote control, power came rushing back to the operations booth. Foley had lost no time in activating subconscious sleepers planted below Goblin Offender's neck. That put half the Bawakao out of action right away. Then he reprogrammed Police Plaza's own DNA cannons for non-lethal bursts. It was all over in seconds. Captain Kelp's first thought was for his subordinates. Sound off, he shouted, his voice slicing through the chaos. Did we lose anyone? The squadron leaders answered in sequence, confirming that there had been no fatalities. We were lucky, remarked a warlock medic. There was not a drop of magic left in the building, not even a medipack. The ex officer to go down would have stayed down. Trouble turned his attention to the ops booth. He did not look amused. 
fully depolarized the quartz window and opened a channel. Hey guys, I wasn't behind this. It was Kudgeon. I just saved everyone. I sent a sound recording to a cell phone. That wasn't easy. You should be giving me a medal. Trouble clenched his fist. Yeah, Foley, come on out here and I'll, let's give me a medal. Foley may not have had many social skills, but he knew thinly veiled threats when he heard them. Oh no, not me. I'm staying right here until Commander Roots gets here. He can explain everything. The centaur blacked out the window and busied himself running a bug sweep. He would isolate every last chance trace of Copo Coboy and flush it out of the system. Paranoid, was he? Who was the paranoid one now, Holly? Who was the paranoid one now?